Does Inez have a call to read? She should. Okay. I do. Oh wait. Let's do oh, okay. a let's do a pledge of allegiance first, please. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the United States, of, the United of, States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty justice and justice for all. Thank you. Inez, would you read the call, please? Absolutely. Town of Farmington, Town Plan and Zoning Commission. Notice is hereby given that the Town Plan and Zoning Commission will hold an online public hearing Monday, April 13th and 20th, 2020 at the Town Hall Council Chambers at 7 p.m. on the following applications. Um, actually, I'm, I need to stop because uh, it's the one from last week. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I don't know that we need to reread it um, because it's been read it's in. It's been opened. It's been opened. Okay, right. and it's a continuation. Okay, sorry about that. No, that's that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. We'll begin the agenda with new business, Westwood's Country Club, so that everybody knows that this is Barbara Brenneman, Chair of Planning and Zoning in Farmington, uh, chairing the meeting. I um, would like to have the new business begin with Westwood's Country Club, the site plan approval to expand the deck at 14 Westwood's Drive. Hello, everybody. This is Mark DeVoe. Um, I just want to bring this to you. This, this application was actually made by Russ Arnold on behalf of the town of Farmington. The, um, the, you may recall that a proposed bar shed, uh, they're still calling it proposed, was approved by this commission um, last fall. And the, the uh, management would like to um, add on to the existing deck, which is shown here in uh, yellow, this red portion would be an enlargement of that existing deck. Um, this requires site plan approval, and the um, I, I believe they're negotiating with a, a new um, uh, vendor? Yeah, new vendor. Um, one that we can't say at this point, but that everybody knows. And uh, they're thinking that they would like to try to draw more people into the establishment, and uh, they probably are going to be putting up some sort of tarp system, temporary tarp system, summer only, uh, over the deck to be able to provide a uh, more meeting space and uh, eating and drinking uh, area to be, to be uh, more accurate. And uh, I'll leave it with that. Do you have any questions? Do any of the commissioners have questions about this? None, huh? No. All right, then, as we have been doing on in these online meetings, uh, we will vote on the issue as it is brought to us. Um, so for the Westwoods Country Club, I would need a motion to approve the site plan approval, a site plan approval to expand the deck at 14 Westwoods Drive. No motion? Are we on? You're on. Can you hear me? This is Marcy. I Put a proposal that we approve the new deck and the bar shed at the Westwoods golf course. I think the bar, the bar shed has already been approved, Marcy. Okay. All right. So it's then just I the expansion a, of the deck. I make a proposal for the expansion of the deck at the Westwoods golf course as proposed. May I have a second, please? I second. That second was from who? I'm sorry. Uh, Patrick Carrier, I second. Thank you, Patrick. Does everyone understand what we're voting on? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to the Farmington High School Building Committee, an informal presentation. Thank you. 
Uh, let me ask, who will be... Um, okay. You, you, Meg, you, she said. Very good. Okay. Take the stage, my friend. <laughs> uh, this is Michael Scott with TSKP Studios. Is uh, Richard also... Yes, I'm here this evening. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Um, so what I would like to do is a brief introduction of the project. Uh, and then Michael Scott, who is a senior architect with my firm, uh, will continue the presentation and get you into more of the details. So this first Richard, slide is an me, Richard, would you identify yourself for the recording, please? Yes, of course. My name is Richard Sipek. First name is spelled R-Y-S-Z-A-R-D. Last name is spelled S-Z-C-Z-Y-P-E-K. I'm a registered architect in the state of Connecticut. I'm a partner at a firm called TSKP Studio, an architectural firm located in Hartford. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. So um, this first slide is an aerial photograph of the Farmington High School site as it currently exists. Uh, you can see on the left side of the slide, the Farmington River running parallel with the river is um, Route 4. And then uh, going up the slope, you can see the library with the parking lot uh, in front of it. And then above the library or past the library, you can see the existing high school complex, which is an assembly of buildings um, that have been built on the site over time. And the most prominent building on that, in that assembly of buildings is the historic 1928 building with the cupola. So that's one of the landmarks on the site. To the rear of the site, you can see the football stadium. You can see a baseball field next to it. And in the right side of the site, you can see a number of tennis courts. Uh, so those are the major landmarks uh, of the site. Uh, the next slide, Mark, if you could advance it, is um, the site as it will be when the new building will be built. You can see the footprint of the proposed new building in that light blue, uh, sort of a rectangular but somewhat irregular shape. Uh, we need to build the new building while the existing building remains occupied. This is not an unusual situation. We've run into this kind of um, scenario many, many times. It's very rare to have a school building have available site elsewhere and then come back to the site when the new building is built. So, this issue of building a new building while the existing building is occupied is a matter that has presented itself many times to us in the past. Uh, probably the most recent experience, most recent comparable experience is Guilford High School. Uh, and in that scenario, we also had to build the existing building. And in that case, it was even closer to the existing building. So what we're proposing to do is build a construction fence that will allow this site construction and building construction to occur in a safe manner and keep the population that is occupying the students, the, the students, the existing building separate, I should say. Um, a few other landmarks, there's a street that leads into the site from the right side. You can sort of see that in the background of this aerial photograph, that's Briar Wood. And then running more toward the rear of the parcel, there's a street that runs parallel to that diagonal property line, that's Knollwood. Thank you for pointing that out, that's very helpful. And then there's a, a circular street called Crestwood that comes down into that rear property line, uh, that's to the right. Uh, if you look at the figures 18 to 20 months for new construction, just above the figures 18 to 20, you can sort of see in the background a Kirby Street. Yes, perfect, excellent. So that's uh, another uh, landmark that we'll be talking to you about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we do need to build some temporary parking on the site in order to accommodate the construction workers that will be coming here. 
uh, and if you can see where the existing library footprint is and the parking lot adjacent to the library on the site, you'll see we've labeled a space there called temporary parking. That's an area that's sort of level, but we will be making uh, a suitable parking lot, a temporary for the construction workers during the duration of uh, the, the new construction. And once the new building is finished, then the existing building will be abated and demolished. If we could go to the next slide. You can see then once the existing buildings are demolished, uh, which are shown in dotted red line, you can see uh, then we'll have an open field for we can and we can finish the remainder of the project. The only parts of the existing building complex that we are keeping standing are that historic 1928 building. And then there's another segment that is that white rectangular box you can see on the plan. That is what we call the 900 wing. That wing of the existing building is the most recent addition that was built to the high school that was built in 2003. And so it's not old. Uh, we can certainly reuse it in the new complex. And in fact, we do have a purpose for that 900 wing, which we'll explain a little bit later. In front of the new footprint of the building, you can see some parking areas. You can see some bus loop areas. And between the bus loop and that parking, you can see there's a green stripe leading into what's the main entrance into the school. That green stripe is a pedestrian walkway. It's actually pavement as well as some landscaping leading into the main entrance. There's a second entrance into the building, which is, if you will, on the western side of this footprint. That's in that space between the 900 wing and the new building. There's a drive that leads to the rear parking lot and sort of midway through that drive, you can see that there's an entrance just to the right of um, that driveway. That is the after hours entrance. That's the after hours that leads into the gymnasium the cafeteria, and so on. If we go to the next slide, you can see the final uh, configuration of the site plan. This has, however, been modified a number of times. We are going to update this site plan a little bit later in the presentation, but you can see the intention is to then place tennis courts, baseball field, softball field, and additional parking in order to finish this complex. Um, on the rear of the footprint of the new building will be the service entrance into the school. There's a right there, perfect. That's the service entrance into the building. So that's on the backside uh, of this complex. Uh, there will be two security gates to the right of the building or on the east side of the building. You can see there's a emergency drive that runs parallel with the property line, that emergency drive is not available for anything other than emergency vehicles. So we will be placing security gates at one end at the northern end of that drive and also another gate at the southern end of that emergency drive with access only by emergency vehicles. Uh, we're also planning to build a berm and some plantings along the eastern edge of the property and then along that diagonal property line on the rear side of the site. Yes, that's perfect. Um, so the next thing we'd like to do is um, talk a little bit about the configuration of the building. Uh, we'll start with the model in the next slide. This is a three-dimensional representation of the site. You can see the upper fields, which we're not changing, the existing football field, which we're not changing. There's the renovated 2003 wing called the 900 wing and the new high school which is shown in blue, as you can see in this diagram. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Michael Scott. He's a senior architect with my firm. Uh, he's been um, the project architect working closely with me on this. I'd like to ask him to continue the presentation at this point. Michael? All right, thank you all very much. Again, for the record, my name is Michael Scott. Um, so Richard did a good job of orienting you all to the building. Uh, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. And, oh, 
can we go back one, Mark, please? Thank you. Just real quick, we're going to look at uh, three views from the ground. Uh, the first one will be that center one that says view of the main entrance. And then we'll move to the second one, which is called the view between the buildings. So that will be a view looking between the um, 900 wing that is renovated and the new building. And then the last one, we're going to look right up the east property line between the new school and uh, the property line with the adjacent neighbors. Um, we worked hard to locate the new school in such a way that we tried to both maximize the setback from the east property line while also uh, providing enough separation between the existing school building and the new construction site to allow us to safely construct the new building while the existing building was occupied. So let's start with the main entrance of the new facility. So this is a view on the ground uh, looking at that central pedestrian way. This will become the main entrance to the school. So if you come to the school as a student or as a parent during school hours, this is the only way in and out of the school. To the right hand side is the bus drop off loop and those buses queue up in that area to the right. And to the left hand side, is the vehicular drop off. So if you're a parent uh, picking up your student or dropping them off, um, th that's where you go. Um, to the um, left-hand side of the view, that two-story wing on the first floor, that's the main administration. That's the central office that you will be buzzed into through a sally port and nice secure entryway. And then uh, the story above that is the counseling wing. So that we have good, uh, good administrative eyes on the front door of the building. To the right-hand side, you'll see uh, a vertical circulation tower, one of the uh, main ways up and down uh, the school. And then we have a three-story wing, which are the primary classroom spaces. Next slide, please. So, if I ran laterally to my left about a couple of hundred feet, I would be in this view, which is the view that we call between the buildings. To the left-hand side, you see the existing uh, 900 wing. That's the building that was constructed in 2003. And we should all recognize that glass tower, which is how most of the students who arrive by vehicle, by car, enter the building today. And then that is a long one-story wing that we will be maintaining. Uh, it's good uh, construction that is still useful. We'll uh, maintain the field house application there, as well as relocate uh, edge, um, Board of Ed central office. We'll uh, move them out of town hall into this wing. Uh, there's a landscaped uh, plaza between the two buildings. There's a service road and main vehicular access that gets you back to the stadium and the rear lot for uh, staff and administra administration. But the left-hand side is um, the real public areas of the new school. That two-story wing in the foreground is the auditorium and the music rehearsal space. There's also a black box theater there. There's a gap and then that rear two-story wing are the uh, two gymnasia. What we do is we utilize that gap in the middle as the after hours entrance to the school. In other words, if there's a lot of public coming to the school for an evening program, either in the auditorium or in one of the gymnasiums, we will utilize this entryway as the main coming and goings that keeps a majority of the traffic and commotion for the big events to the school interior to the property rather than along one of the edges as it is now. Um, you'll recall that the current layout, the auditorium is to the far west and there pushes a lot of activity to that, uh, the narrowest corner of the site. 
I'd like to talk about the eastern property line against the residential neighbors uh, right now, if I can. So can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. This is the current condition of that eastern property line. That tree line more or less is the legal property line. And you can see through the trees some hints of the residential houses beyond. You'll see a slight berming of the topography along that edge. And believe it or not, there's a fence in the woods there. Um, you really can't see it. Um, there is a, a narrow asphalt path uh, that uh, comes off uh, the parking lot between the tennis courts and the baseball field. That large field of snow to the left is the current baseball field. And that is used for emergency vehicle access and um, from adjacent residential street from Crestwood, but it's also used to get, should you need to get an emergency vehicle up to the athletic fields you could certainly do that. Um, all of these are good planning notion and good um, landscape notions. But with this scheme, we're looking to make these relationships more purposeful and uh, do more work for us. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is the pr proposed view. And I've switched the uh, location of the eye here. I'm, I'm closer to the property line and I'm looking parallel now to the property line rather, rather than obliquely across the baseball field. What you're seeing to the left-hand side is um, two classroom pods. Each of them are three stories. In between is a uh, outdoor plaza that spills off of some lounge and cafeteria spaces. This uh, we envision would be used midday, uh, perhaps for some spill out activity, akin to what happens now in the existing school around the media center or in that um, courtyard uh, with the flagpoles that's been cut off from vehicular access. The face of these two classroom wings have been pulled back 150 feet from the property line. So there's a pretty good lawn. Uh, and then we get to a road bed that is not asphalt. It's either um, pavers or stamped asphalt. It's 14 foot, feet wide and it's for emergency vehicle access only. So there would be a gate at either end of this road that we'll show you later. But it's really there should uh, the town have a need to get back behind that site. Otherwise, it exists as an expansion of the pedestrian pathways that loop through the site, go up to the upper fields, and connect to some of the trail systems within the neighborhood. Between the roadbed and the property line, we've introduced a 40 foot wide by six foot high landscape berm that runs the length of the eastern property site. Not only will this uh, help shield the sight lines from the adjacent residential lots, but it should uh, also provide a bit of an acoustical barrier as well. The berm itself is planted heavily with evergreens and some deciduous plants. But the idea here is that the building itself buffers the, resi the adjacent residences from um, activities on the sports fields. And then the berm extends into the view of this picture and then turns with the property line to help shield the parking lot that's in the rear of um, the school that the staff and the administration use. Can we go to the next slide? This is a nighttime view of the building. Uh, by and large, the classrooms will experience their peak use during school hours. Um, anyone who's been in Farmington for very long understands that there's quite a bit of after hours activities in the school as well. Um, no doubt that that will continue, but we can help control the light in the classrooms by pulling shades or doing room darkening. 
what we wanted to feature here especially was the idea that in the evening, it's really only that center space that is lit. For emergency purposes, we will light the plaza outside of that space for egress. And that pathway to that main connector road will be lit as well. But we envision doing that with low landscape lighting and keeping um, light fixtures to a minimum these will be uh, all cut off light fixtures, so there will be no light leak. And uh, we literally hope to keep this in the three foot to three and a half foot high range and just do it all with bollards. The idea here is to have this thing after hours sent, sit as gently in the landscape as possible. I'd like now to look uh, more carefully at the relationship of these elements as they stack up across this site. Uh, you'll recall that this is a very large parcel, um, but let's look at it in a little more detail. Could I have the next slide? This is a section through the entire site. So essentially that model photo, uh, which was the slide that I started talking, uh, if we cut that in half and then held it up sideways to the view. Working left to right, you see the upper soccer fields, which will exist more or less as they exist today. We're going to improve the accessibility up to the upper fields, but we don't envision uh, functionally changing uh, their nature. The berm between the upper field and the football field is, is the main grandstand for the stadium. And again, we don't envision too many changes there. We are going to improve accessibility to both the press box and to the bleachers. The football field itself sits a little higher on the site than the new building. But as you move from the football field to the new building, uh, somewhere in between those two things uh, would be the access road, the service road that goes back to the rear parking lot so that faculty and administration that come to the school would drive on that road every day. But then there's the school proper. The left-hand side is predominantly two stories because those are the large uh, gathering spaces, the gymnasium and the auditorium. And then the right-hand side is that uh, classroom core that we discussed. Um, moving away from the three-story building, you can see the lawn uh, that's in front of the building, and then that landscape berm, 40 feet wide and six feet tall before the property line. Could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so here I've zoomed in to the right-hand side of that drawing, and I'm really trying to highlight the features of the building's relationship to the property line um, for the adjacent neighborhood. You see the building as we described, but more importantly in yellow, you see the property line, you see the 150 foot setback. We've tried to squeeze that classroom elevation uh, to be as low as possible. This is a portion of the building that is three stories. Um, and then we've tried to highlight the lawn in front of the building and tried to depict accurately what a heavily planted landscape uh, berm would be. Uh, and then you see the adjacent neighbors. At some point in time, we will need to uh, build or repair the fence that runs along that property line. Um, it's, we're really relying on the berm to do most of the work for sight line and uh, noise control. The fence is there just to um, discourage capricious walking back and forth uh, across the parcel. Next slide, please. This drawing highlights the extent of the landscape berm. Um, it's uh, most heavily graded as it's adjacent to the uh, blue building, but the landscaping starts uh, at the southern end at the bus loop, 
follows that eastern property line and then turns uh, along the edge of that parking lot. Again, that, um, may, that red oval may look slight, but keep in mind that that's uh, 40 feet wide and six feet tall at its, at its midpoint. Uh, the site is maybe deceptively large uh, compared to the residential parcels, but these are, um, these are big areas that we're talking about. Next slide, please. Looking uh, carefully at the relationship of uh, the proposed slight site plan with uh, the area highlighted in A, which is the dead end at Briarwood, and then at B, the dead end at Crestwood. Um, we're gonna focus on um, each of these individually. So next slide, please. So A, this is an existing shot of the end of Briarwood as it comes towards the existing tennis courts uh, at the school. And we see, again, uh, some indication of the rising topography that already exists at the property line. Uh, we also get a good sense of how heavily planted that uh, area is right now. Uh, I'll remind everyone that we intend to plant another 40 feet deep into that parcel with additional ever evergreens. But more importantly, at the end of Briarwood, there is a small pedestrian path that connects into the school. We understand that this is used by local students uh, who walk back and forth to the high school, but it's also an element that uh, members of the community use in order to access um, the trails and the fields that are uh, part of the high school property. We would look to uh, maintain that situation, ease the berm in this location so that that pedestrian path could be maintained, um, and to the extent that we can improve it on the school uh, side of the property line, we will. Down below in photo B, this is the existing condition at the end of uh, Crestwood. And again, I would highlight the slight rise in topography and the heavy uh, foliage that exists along that property line. Um, this area has an extension of the roadbed that leads back to a 13 foot wide gate that the town has access to. Again, we would look to ease the berm in this location and recreate the gate at the property line, keeping it at 13 feet. That gate would remain locked, but uh, town vehicles and emergency vehicles would have access to the key. Um, so if for some reason, uh, the main access to the site on Monteith um, had, it was congested or disabled, emergency vehicles could still get on site at this location. Next slide, please. Thank you. Here, I just want to highlight uh, a few other features of the site uh, that Richard had mentioned, uh, but I want to call to your attention. Um, basically, the, the everyday circulation patterns to and through and from the school will remain the same. Everyone will enter the property on, off of Monteith and exit the property off of Monteith. The project budget does include uh, improvements to Monteith to create two dedicated inbound lanes and two dedicated outbound lanes. So hopefully we can help with some of the congestion there. Most of the time, people will ascend Monteith, come up to that small landscape circle. And if you're a bus or a car dropping someone off, you'll go to the right to do those loops. And if you're faculty or staff, you'll go to the left and follow the blue line, dotted line that takes you back to that rear parking lot to the north of the property. But more importantly, off peak hours, that blue line is also the dedicated line that all service vehicles will take. The service yard for the building, as Richard mentioned, is in that back rear corner 
by the stadium. And you can see it in a white rectangle with a blue surround. That will be where all of the main equipment is, where all the food deliveries come and go, and where uh, the tr trash is deposited and retrieved. So all of that traffic, which currently is pushed to the front of the parcel, it, uh, goes along the back edge of the library in front of the 1928 building, then loops around uh, the auditorium back to the edge. All of that um, off-peak traffic has been pushed into the middle of the parcel to help mitigate in, uh, its impact both um, to the adjacent neighborhoods, but more importantly to the site circulation with kids moving back and forth from the field. Over to the right-hand side, uh, we'll try it again to reinforce and highlight what we think the emergency vehicle access will be uh, on the site. All of those improvements between the building and the east property line uh, really, really will exist as a pedestrian and student realm uh, only by use of dropping the gates with a key can that be opened up for vehicular circulation. So during a football game or during an after hours performance, all traffic will be routed through that blue line rather than uh, get pushed up against uh, the residential neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a technical site plan. As Richard alluded to, uh, we're already making improvements to this. Um, but I wanted to show you it um, for the time being. This um, Mylona McBroom is our landscape architect and civil engineer uh, who has uh, been working with us throughout the competition and is helping us develop it. Um, you can see uh, um, Mylona McBroom are good, efficient users of their paper space. So they've rotated the entire site 90 degrees uh, for their presentation. So the river is to the right and Monteith is running uh, right to left. Um, and then the school building. And you can see the thing that looks like black confetti sprinkled in a long line. That is the landscape berm around the rear uh, parking lot and the eastern edge of the property. Um, we uh, will continue to develop this site plan uh, and make it uh, more of a technical drawing. Uh, currently, we're cons uh, considering um, taking the green rectangle, which is the tennis courts, and relocating that in order to uh, maximize parking. But we look forward to uh, continuing to refine um, this layout uh, with precision, but in conjunction with your town staff and with you, the commission, as we continue. Next slide, Mark, please. Oh, you did incorporate it. I'm sorry. Um, this is the improved uh, site plan. This is, I tell you, I, I, um, I was telling Tim Harris, uh, director of school facilities today in an earlier meeting in which we reviewed the site plan, that I think of all of our town clients uh, Farmington has consistently demonstrated the most resiliency during this time period. And I'm, uh, I mean, um, consistently uh, impressed at how uh, good you are, all are at rolling with the punches here. So this is a site plan I literally sent Mark about 4.30 today, and I did not expect it to be part of this. So well done. Michael. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so pleased. I, I could have I could have talked about the last slide for like two seconds and then gone right to this one. But anyhow, uh, so this hopefully looks a lot like what I just talked about, but looks even better. Okay, so what we've done here that's a little different is uh, the area uh, which is below the 2003 wing or what we call the 900 wing. Um, which is really to the west, we've, uh, we've taken the tennis courts out from there and we've put additional parking uh, to service these fields. 
uh, you see the 1928 building running up and down. And then um, most importantly here, what, what we thought we would entertain in this drawing is down the slope, halfway between Route 4 and the 1928 building, is a, a beautiful green lawn uh, that we have to do um, a considerable amount of site work on to create that temporary parking lot. And rather than just uh, losing all of that um, site improvement uh, money that it would take to do that, um, and given that the disposition of the, of the 1928 building to the road um, will change once the new school is added to the site, you will ascend to the new school rather than to the 1928 building. We thought it was a good use of the town's money to relocate the tennis courts to that half level, about 20 feet uh, down the slope from the main campus and about 30 feet above uh, the traffic on Route 4. So this would be accessible both uh, from the upper campus, but also from uh, the library parking lot and uh, may in fact uh, make the tennis courts more of a town asset than uh, property of the school um, proper, for lack of a better word. So uh, we're getting this scheme priced and uh, looking more into it. I should mention too, um, very quickly, uh, the uh, improvements that we are proposing to the intersection of Monteith and Route 4. You'll see, uh, if you squint in your eyes, um, you'll see a civil at alternate number one road improvements. We're tracking uh, what we and your town engineer believe to be much needed improvements to get traffic uh, onto Monteith more safely and more expeditiously. Um, we just had a discussion with him uh, in that same meeting this afternoon on how we will track it, but no doubt um, some element of this project will include some uh, additional attention to that in intersection. Okay, Mark, we're coming, we're bringing this thing home. So just a few more slides, if you don't mind one more, please. Um, running through the bulk standards, this is a, this parcel is a large parcel, but it is zoned R40, uh, residential zone. Uh, therefore, we understand that the school use will be by special permit. So um, we are really looking forward to a successful referendum and then coming back to you all, uh, all elements of your commission to make a formal application, but it will be by special permit. Uh, what I've done real quick is I've just run down the bulk standards as we understand them for the R40 zone, uh, described what their minimums were, and then listed where we fit in this uh, with our current scheme. Uh, so you can see where we fit from building height to minimum frontage to lot size and to um, front yard, side yard, and rear yard. Um, obviously, this is a very large project for the R40 zone. But uh, I think what these bulk standards show is that it's also a very large parcel for the, for the R40 zone. So what you get with the large project is all of those numbers uh, hopefully scale up commensurate um, to, the, to the project scope. Real quick, let's look at some floor plans, Mark. Uh, like my loan in McBroom, I've rotated the building 90 degrees here so that the main entrance where the bus drop off and car drop off are, are to the far right of this drawing. The two pink rectangles are the main classroom wings. But hopefully what you see here is how the school is, uh, purports to be organized. Off of that main entrance, there's a 20-foot wide clear corridor that splits the school in half. To the right, to the, as you walk up that corridor, um, there would be to your right, the classroom. So up the page are all the main classroom spaces. And to the left are all of the large group education spaces 
are where the uh, arts and gathering happen. So you see the auditorium in orange, you see the music rooms in uh, slightly darker orange, and in green you see the gymnasium and the weight rooms. To the rear of the building is the arts wing, which is uh, tech ed and visual arts. Um, also bisecting the building up and down on this page, but east-west on the site, is a very wide gathering space that separates the auditorium and the gymnasium. This is used for three periods a day as a cafeteria, but during a bulk of the school day will be a lounge space and group workspace for the students. This is something that really doesn't exist in the existing school, which is uh, space is packed full of program and is uh, starved for flexible meeting space. But more importantly, during the evening, um, this space will be the foyer or vestibule for both the auditorium and the gymnasium events. So all the people can gather there. And that black rectangle at the bottom of the page highlights that after our entrance um, between those two pieces. I feel like I've talked about this enough, so I'm gonna move on. And I, I, if I'm running through the plans too quickly, I would, I'll just defer to um, question and answer at the end. So next slide, please. So as the building goes up, uh, it becomes smaller in plan. So here we see the second floor of the auditorium in yellow in the middle is the uh, media center and then a special ed wing on the back and the upper half of the building, the browns and the pinks are essentially a duplication of what was below. But hopefully you see the uh, left right spine and the up down spine as being big organizing principles for this large building. Next slide, please. Lastly, the, um, the highest level, the third floor is the smallest level by, four, by far. It's uh, less than a quarter of the building area and it's just those two classroom wings um, that are, are learning pods of and then last, last, lastly will be hopefully my final slide, uh, which is the renovated uh, 2003 wing or what Richard and I call the 900 wing as it exists. The spaces in green uh, face the stadium and those are currently field houses for the sports teams. And we'll be looking to add to that a little bit for some Title IX parity with the team rooms. And then everything you see in blue is a repartitioning of old, of, of current classroom spaces into admin space so that everyone in um, central office can move out of town hall and be a part of this campus. I believe if you click one more, that will be the end of the presentation. Okay. Maybe this flat out is, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Michael, I would just like to wrap up uh, with just a couple of comments. One is that um, obviously this is not a formal site plan submission. This is an informational session for the commission to see. Uh, the project is not a real project yet. It won't become a real project until it's presented to the public in a referendum and the public votes positively to uh, proceed with the project. Now our schedule is that we need to go back to the town council uh, and I promised the building committee that we would have this meeting with the commission in order to get some feedback. I'd like to be able to report to the building committee and then subsequently to the town council that we have done that and that we have solicited your comments and if there are things that you want us to address we can certainly address and we can certainly have a follow-up meeting. So at this stage, I would like to uh, ask members of the commission if they have any questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. And I, we welcome um, your input. We hope that our commissioners have some input. Is there anyone on the commission that would like to have a question answered or make a comment? Please Hi. do so. 
Oh, thank you. Sorry about that, Barbara. Uh, it's Ines St. James. Uh, and again, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, done well and I could follow it along. So I appreciate it for sure. Uh, when I think about the high school project, uh, one of the things that um, I think is important is the visibility from the neighboring properties. Um, and I really like what I saw. I think that um, what you're proposing between the height and the width of the berm and the plantings uh, takes care of that. So thank you. Um, not really sure about lighting impacts. Um, just, uh, you know, lighting obviously is a concern. It, it is a big issue in any community, especially in a neighborhood community. I wasn't sure like in, for the service slash teacher parking, like what happens with the lighting there? Because that one is pretty close to the neighbors. And, and the last thing I'll say, and sorry, I'm just throwing it out that way, is uh, the backup to Route 4 that we have today, just wondering how you can help us with that. So it's backup on Route 4 and also from school onto Route 4. Sure. So let me uh, tackle a couple of things. This is Richard Zipic again, and then I'll ask Michael to jump in as well. Uh, we're very concerned about uh, interrupting the neighbors and visibility through to the new building as well as lighting. That's why we went to the effort of creating some lighting diagrams. Uh, today, you're able to create three-dimensional images and actually put light fixtures using software into the image so you get a pretty good representation of uh, lighting effects. Uh, we didn't prepare an illustration of the back parking lot, faculty parking lot or the service area, but we can certainly do that in follow-up meetings. We know that we have to have zero cutoff for light, zero light spillage onto neighbors. I can assure you that that will be done. Um, but um, rest assured that also we will be able to come back in subsequent reviews with the commission on how those different corners of the site will look during the day as well as during the night. As far as the backup on Route 4, we had a conversation earlier today. We, we've continued to have conversations. Well, we had conversations earlier with the town engineer and with the police department and fire and safety. So backup on Route 4 has been brought up a number of times. We are um, pricing out right now some changes at that intersection, including turning lanes heading east as well as turning lanes heading uh, west entering into the site. So that should in, improve the backup situation. Right now it's a line of cars will hold up traffic for long periods of time and turning lanes will certainly help. As far as Monteith itself is concerned, you don't really have uh, two lanes in both directions. You really have one lane, but people are misunderstanding it and using it as two lanes. So we want to make a proper two-lane ingress as well as a two-lane egress for vehicles coming into the site and exiting the site. Uh, so that's also part of the budgeting process. Michael, do you want to add to that? No, I think you got it, Richard. That was very, that's about all that I would add. Okay, <laughs> very good. Thank you very much, thank you. Anyone else? Matthew Pogson here. I, uh, yes, I liked your presentation. Uh, one of the things that I liked was the uh, berm along the property. I, I like the fact that you're helping the neighbors uh, by blocking off some of the stuff coming from the school, some of the noise, some of the trees uh, will help to keep that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully keep the noise down. Hopefully uh, by putting the building where it is too, we'll keep some of the noise down from the, uh, playing fields. I mean, having a, I, if anything, I'd recommend that you make the berm bigger than it is. And the reality is the, the bigger that you can make that, the more noise you're gonna cut down for the neighbors and the better quality of life for them they're going to have uh, because it's still gonna be a pretty loud uh, environment on the other side of that berm. Um, it also hides all the stuff that you see behind it too because they don't really wanna look at all that stuff behind the berm. Um, it's also kind of nice because um, you're using the same property that you already have. Um, you're trying to work with what you have and make it the best that you possibly can with what you have. 
I mean, this, this building would be better if it was on a different property somewhere else, somewhere, you know, more secluded, not with neighbors right there. But the reality is that it, it is what it is and you're working with what you have and you're trying to make the best out of it. And I really appreciate the fact that you're doing that. Um, the only other thing that I'd like to add um, was the tennis courts and the location of those that you kind of popped in there today. Um, I've been following this process very closely, so a lot of this is not new to me. Um, I'm very impressed with everything you've done. Um, I do believe that the location of those tennis courts may be something um, that may have further discussion. I think that hill has been used for sledding. It's been used for a lot of fun activities throughout the years. I grew up here in town and it's, a, it's kind of a, an event location, if you will. And I don't know that um, that having the tennis courts in that location is really something that um, is appropriate for the location. Um, times change, things change, and maybe it is the location that it's going to be decided upon. But other than that, I'm happy with everything, but the tennis courts, I think, may need to be thought about a little bit further. Um, besides that, uh, your project is well thought out, and I appreciate all the time and effort you put into it. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say that um, I understand what you're saying about the tennis courts. I will also tell you that we have not even had a chance to discuss this with the building committee, but we did have a conversation with town staff earlier today in which we um, floated this idea out there. Um, so there's no decision that has been made on that particular aspect of the site plan. We will go back to the building committee. We have a meeting scheduled with them on the 29th, and I'm sure we will have a lengthy discussion with them about it. But I, I appreciate your comment. Someone else? Uh, this is Marcy Schwartz and, and Barbara. Uh, well, again, uh, similar to the others, it's a great presentation. I appreciate it. I think the only um, comment that I have is really around that one road that's traveling between the two, the existing 1903 building and the new proposed building and the fact that all of not just the faculty, but also you're saying all delivery will be going through there. And I don't know if there's been any thought given to moving that, at least the delivery trucks in some other, something that's not going through where the students are walking back and forth with cell phones in their hands because that's how people walk these days. So that would be my, um, my single thought. Otherwise, I think it looks, it looks very good. And I agree with my colleagues about the, uh, the berm and, but uh, that, that driving through there scares me a little bit. That, that's a good observation. We'll certainly bring that back to the building committee for further discussion. I will tell you, having done many school projects in the past, that delivery is always a subject that is discussed and studied. Uh, and it's a thing that can be scheduled also. So you can schedule deliveries and removal of trash at times that you're not having a lot of pedestrian traffic okay. or, or student circulation. And, and no students would be driving here uh, unless it were uh, at a game event, let's say on the weekend at the stadium. During, right. normal, during normal school hours, only faculty would be on that road. Yeah, and, but even even uh, for events, if the if the locker rooms are on the other side of the road in the old building, then that means there's a lot of traffic going. Uh, that's off. a good point. Well, that's why we put the, the that's why in the 900 wing we are putting in locker areas. The team lockers would be there, so they wouldn't necessarily be crossing that driveway. But well, wouldn't they? Because then they're going to the gym. They're in the locker, and then they're going to go to whatever activity. It, um, am well, I confused? There are, there are lockers in the gym area for Oh, okay. Okay. And there are lockers in the 900 wing for field activities. Ah, gotcha. Okay, thank you. That helps a bit. But, yeah, I, the road seems a little scary, but... Understood. Okay, thanks. Thank so, you, Marcy. Anyone else? Uh, oh, yeah, this is, uh, okay. yeah, this is Patrick, Patrick Carrier. Um, yeah, I do have a, yeah, I have a question about the blinds. Um, you know, you have the lighting and you were saying that, you know, through the use of the blinds, even though they're 
there are activities at night. Are those blinds going to be automatic or is that something that, you know, whoever's using that room is going to have to remember to close or open and so on and so forth? Well, most often blinds are manually drawn. They're not automatic. Um, right. That's something that we can talk about with the building committee. Um, maybe there's a way that we can put an indication near the light switch so that if someone is turning on the light, you know, there's a, 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 um, a, a reminder, let's say, next to the light switch that say pull the blinds at certain times of the day, you know, in order to prevent interrupting the neighbors. I think that, oh, you know, I, I'm sure that the high school wants to be good neighbors um, and there may be a policy established by the school administration to make sure that blinds are drawn. Um, that's certainly something that we can bring back to the committee and to the school administration for further discussion. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sure that they want to be good neighbors. And so if there's such a policy that needs to be established, I'm sure they will be agreeable to that. Thank you, Patrick. Anyone else? Uh, this is uh, John Vibbert. Hi, John. How are you doing? Good. Uh, I, so I have a question uh, concerning uh, the emergency exits. Uh, that, and through the competition process, there were, we've seen many, many plans. A number of them had an exit road going off on the west side. Uh, is that eliminated from your plan? So we, we did talk about uh, that in an early stage of the development of the design during competition. Um, we did examine that with my loan and room. You're talking about looking at this site plan to the left um, to right. get to uh, Highwood, yeah. to the, get to the Highwood yes. area. But we have, what we found based upon our studies is that it's very difficult to get uh, cut through in that area. The topography is not very friendly. We would have to be building quite significant retaining walls in order to get a roadway through there. So um, in the end, we chose not to recommend that as a, an emergency drive. Uh, it is possible to get emergency vehicles on the eastern side through that Crestwood. There would be a gate there and we'll be working with first responders to see what they would need for with and access to that gate after hours or in an emergency situation. So I think that's good. I think that a number of the neighbors on the, in the Crosswoods side were concerned about that. Right. Sorry, on the Highwood side? No, on, yeah. the, on the Crosswood. Oh, yeah. Crosswood, okay. Highwood, Highwood, excuse me, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, we, we're not planning to have any drive from Highwood to the site. Thank you. Anyone else? This Barbara. is Barbara Brennan. Oh. oh, go ahead. Barbara, it's Matt Hogson. I just have one other quick thing. Um, yep. It's a question I've actually had since this all started. Um, I work in education. I'm a technology education teacher. Um, I've worked in several different buildings throughout the years, uh, many of which are similar to the design that you're coming up with as it's a fairly modern design. Um, for safety, has, has this been brought to um, Homeland Security or to whoever it needs to go through to make sure that it is being um, made as safe as possible? Uh, I've noticed that there's a lot of glass, especially the front atrium and the front, uh, um, whatever you want to call that foyer, uh, that's all glass. And I know that where I worked actually at Hamden High School, uh, previous to where I am now, that whole uh, foyer was glass as well. And they spent a tremendous amount of money putting a film up to make it bullet resistant. Um, is that something that's been taken into consideration already and is already into this budget? Uh, as I said, I've been following this right along, but I haven't seen too much about that specific topic. So I am kind of curious and it seems like a, a reasonable time to ask that question. So. If you can provide any additional information, I would appreciate it. Sure. So <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we do is we ask school administration to establish a uh, security task force. 
and that usually is comprised of the police chief, the fire marshal, first responders, uh, health department, uh, and so on. And that, and that task force would be meeting with us on a regular basis to work out all of the details. We've done this before on other projects uh, and we have to do that. That's one of the requirements by, this, by the state in school construction today. You, you may remember that, um, that the governor convened a security advisory group to establish those guidelines. So we're very familiar with those guidelines and we take those very seriously. One of the aspects of security planning is minimize entrances into the school. And that's what we've done. And place those entrances so that they're very easily visible by school administration. Right now you have a facility that has, I don't know how many entrances into the building. And so this strategy of minimizing entrances was used in planning this building. Other things like the type of glazing, whether it's impact resistant is also considered, especially at the ground level. And I'm gonna ask Michael to talk about whether or not a film, an impact resistant film is part of the budget that uh, we've been preparing. On top of that, we have a budget for security systems, monitoring uh, doors, video cameras. Um, I think we were budgeting roughly 200 camera locations in this building. Um, so we know the principles of security planning is to uh, deter, detect, delay. And all of those uh, strategies have been taken into account in this planning. Again, it's the early stages. All of those details will be worked out as we get further into the design. Michael, any other comments? Uh, no, other than the budget that we're, we carried during the competition, um, the specs for all the, the glazing is out of the box uh, ballistic grade. Uh, for the 900 wing, we would, uh, we would utilize an aftermarket product that, that applied on film. Uh, which which is suitable and has been approved by the state, but uh, we would we would utilize that. That building was built in uh, 2003, which um, doesn't seem that long ago, but uh, notably pre Sandy Hook and pre the governor's commission. Right. This is uh, Matthew Pogson again, and I just wanted to say thank you. I really do appreciate it. <clears throat> I have uh, two young daughters who will be going to this school when it's built, and uh, safety is my first and most important thing. And I do appreciate hearing that that much thought has been put into it. Uh, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Michael this is Lewis. Barbara Fred. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. No, just real quick, you know, as Matt said, I've got two young daughters that have gone to the school as well in the future. Um, you know, I appreciate everything that um, ESKP and the, uh, and the whole uh, building committee has done. Um, this was a nice presentation, very informative. And uh, thank you. Look forward to uh, hopefully a successful referendum and uh, be talking to you guys soon. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I had one question. Um, I, I don't know, this is Keith Everett speaking. I don't okay, know if uh, this is the appropriate venue for it, but I'm just wondering if you guys can speak at all yet to the um, plan for energy efficiency for this building. I know that was one of the issues with the old building because there was so many different boilers and, and uh, different heating and cooling devices all around the school that it was tough to manage. Is there a, a good plan in place for how to make this a more efficient building? Yes, and I'm gonna to defer to Michael for the um, studies that we've done, but we always take energy conservation seriously. Uh, we did do an analysis of this building. We had an energy model done uh, which is a method used to determine the amount of energy it would be required uh, for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. This is an air conditioned building that we're planning. So Michael, can you weigh in on, on that study and what our findings were? Right, so um, in order to be eligible for state reimbursement, there are certain minimums that uh, the project must meet from a sustainability and energy performance standard. Those are um, a higher level than uh, straight up building code. And it's something that's specific to the state of Connecticut. 
Um, it's roughly equivalent to LEED Silver, which is an evaluation that the United States uh, Green Building Council has established um, almost two decades ago uh, as a ranking system for how, how um, sustainable and efficient the building is. Uh, long story short, this is a much larger building than your current facility. It's uh, 270,000 square feet versus, in rough numbers, 220,000 square feet. Additionally, this building is going to be uh, fully air conditioned. And uh, we anticipate will actually be used at least 11 months out of the year. That said, with the type of construction that we've called for in our specifications and was budgeted um, for the project, uh, our models indicate that this new facility will operate at uh, somewhere between 30 or $40,000 uh, savings annually in your utility bill. Uh, so th that's pretty good. Um, additionally, we are looking at other initiatives that could be brought to bear on this project to make its um, energy consumption footprint as close to zero as possible. And we're tracking those initiatives with the building committee and uh, that will be a part of their recommendation to the town council as to what would constitute a total project down the road. But um, it's not necessarily to fault the existing building, but the existing building is a product of, its, of the accumulation of all of the decades that it was built. And the fact of the matter is, if you're gonna build building, school buildings in this decade, we're all held to a much higher standard. So right out of the box, uh, we're going to greatly improve your current situation. That's great. And I just want to make one other comment that I think it's um, really great that central office is being moved to the beginning, the entrance uh, area of the building. I think it's great to have all those offices in one place. Um, and I, I, like Matt and Mike, have young kids that will be going to this school eventually. Um, I've been following all along and I really appreciate all the work you guys have put into this. Thank you. Anyone else? I have, I, Barbara Brenneman, I have a couple of questions. Um, my first question is, what is the height of the security fence around the construction site? Oh gosh, we haven't even uh, talked about that in our meetings, um, but I would think it would be at least six feet, perhaps eight feet. That's, that's what I was wondering, because you're backing up to a family neighborhood. So what you're going to have is family kids. Um, and so I would, I would like that really looked at carefully. Um, the other, well, what about uh, anything to do with solar? Has that looked at at all for the utilities? We, we have been looking at that, uh, not only solar, but also geothermal. Um, that has not been finally determined. We have been pricing that. It was a, we had a discussion with the building committee the last time we met with them a few weeks ago. Uh, that's still on the table. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue the discussion. Those would be additional costs um, incurred by the, by the project. Uh, and quite frankly, the payback period is not that favorable, but it's certainly something that we've been looking at. Well, even putting the mechanics in place so that in the future you could add the panels yep. might be something to consider from a budget perspective. Um, at least set it up so that you could do it in the future. Um, I think that's a very good point. And that's a good uh, forward thinking strategy. You know, even if you don't do the photovoltaics today on the roof, at least you should put right. the sleeves, sleeves in to allow for those connections down to the electric service in the future. Right. When talking earlier, one of the commissioners asked about the windows on the east side that would shine out onto the neighborhoods. Is there not um, kind of like one-way glass that could be used in that area? Um, there is. Um, we can certainly look at that. Uh, but I haven't seen anything that completely blocks out light at night. 
Right. If you even if you have one way glass, if the if it's brighter inside than it is outside, it kind of um, compromises that. Or defeats it. Defeats yeah. its own purpose. Right. That's interesting. Um, but I thought that was an interesting perspective, and not necessarily for the first floor of the building, but for the second and third floors where the light would, you know, you would have the display from classroom light. Um, we Somebody brought up the subject of blinds, um, and, and that's, a good, that's a good product to think about, but it's not automated, and it's not something that, um, they keep control over. It's going to be controlled by whoever is actually in the classroom instead of by the building operation. So that's an interesting. Um, and, and I actually have a question for Meg if she's still there. Yep, I'm still here. Meg, um, I'm wondering in the course of your meetings over this last what year? Yes. Um, have, have the have the Highlands neighbors, the Knollwood people and the Crosswood people, have they been coming to the meetings? Yes, actually, we've had um, very good attendance. We've had quite a few of the neighbors speak at public comment uh, during our presentations, um, when we were doing the conceptual design reviews, as well as when we made the presentation okay. to town council. But the other piece to that that I want to mention is we do actually have a very specific uh, focus within our communications uh, subcommittee that's specific to neighborhood communications. So we okay. have reached out, we actually attempted to have a meeting, unfortunately didn't go quite as well as we wanted it to um, about two weeks ago, but we're rescheduling that for next week, specifically yep. to talk with the neighbors, with the abutting neighbors is how we're addressing it, because right. it's really anybody who's abutting this municipal campus um, and just to make sure they understand, they're going to basically get a lot of the information that you guys just received to understand what we thought about, what we've heard about um, TSKP's possible solutions, and then hear about any other concerns maybe that we haven't heard yet, and like give them an opportunity to really engage with us uh, and have, have a place to be able to ask questions. And, and we're going to continue that process throughout. So this, it's not a one and done meeting. This is a, going to be a continual engagement we'll have with the abutting neighbors from now until we don't need to do that anymore, whenever that might be. Well, Meg, I've sat on enough of these for this, this <laughs> complex to know that those folks have strong opinions and it's sometimes easier to start out with them instead of being hit right between the eyes in the middle of the last week. So um, I'm glad that you're doing that. I think your communications from a town newsletter perspective and online uh, perspective has been excellent. So I'm really happy and proud um, at the way that the building committee has functioned. Um, as for the presentation tonight, I think it was terrific. Um, I thank you both for taking the time to do this for us. Um, it gives us, um, for me personally, I have lots of people asking me questions. And all I've said is I haven't seen anything yet. I'm anxious to see what we're going to be looking for um, when this comes to the community. And I'm excited about what I'm seeing. Um, and, and I thank you all for, for taking part. Does any of the other commissioners have anything they'd like to say? Barbara, it's Inessie and James. I forgot to ask a question about parking. Going to events today at the high school, parking could be challenging if there is a game and then a musical at the same time. Are we benefiting with this new plan? Are we getting more spaces? No, probably not. We, we yeah. are increasing. Um, Michael, can you share, shed some light on that? Yeah, the, I, I don't know. Um, I, we've had some spirited discussion with the director of facilities as to how many actual spaces, real spaces, uh, he has on the current cap campus. And um, so I, I'm, I don't want to put anything on the spot, but I, I, I count them at about uh, 525, 526. And this scheme is uh, much closer, almost 600 spaces with that last site plan that I showed you. So. Um, you know, it, it's also a little bit of a balance. You don't want to you don't want to pave that entire beautiful parcel you have up there. But uh, we do right. recognize that there's a, a significant need um, 
that spikes, you know, a dozen times during the year, the year, and you want to be able to address that responsibly. So that's what we're 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 trying to do here. Thank you. Very good. Well, again, um, I think we can complete this presentation. And again, I thank you both for taking the time and you too, Meg, to come and uh, communicate with us. It's important that we as commissioners be able to at least um, be able to talk about the site so far and encourage our community to come to the meetings and take part. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate thank the time. I'm going to move on to the public hearing, which is a continuance for Carrier Holdings LLC, an application for four lot resubdivision of seven Copper Mine Road in an R30 zone, continued from April 13th, 2020. We may want to ask uh, uh, folks to uh, hold off until after the presentation if they have any questions. For carrier? For carrier, because we may, we may have other people that want to. Is, to is Brian here? Brian uh, is here, yeah. yeah. Okay. Brian, um, there were some questions um, that we gave you um, last time. Yep. That we, we continued this to try to be sure we got some information that we may have needed. So are you ready to talk to us? Absolutely. Uh, so for the record, this is Brian Panico with Harry Cole and Son, uh, here representing Carrier Holdings. Um, so just I'll go briefly through uh, the overall presentation of everything in case there's anybody on that, that missed last week. Um, so this is a 3.16 acre uh, parcel. This is an R30 zone. Uh, the majority, um, and actually I'll correct that from the last time, uh, the site is uh, there's a lot of trees on the site as well as a large portion of grass in the center. Um, it is heavily wooded um, kind of throughout uh, the perimeter of the site as a whole as well as in the front yard. Um, it abuts residential properties to the south and the west um, and the Farmington Trail to the east. Um, topographically the site as a whole uh, slopes from the uh, west from the residential property uh, down to the east toward the trail. Um, and so what we were, what we are proposing is a private road with a four lot subdivision. All of the lots will have access off of the private road. So one of the major changes that we made um, to try to, to make sure that we were meeting all the requirements was we did widen the road from 18 to 20 feet, which is part of the regulations. Um, since we did get, we were originally going to ask for a waiver, we opted against asking for the waiver. Um, and so we made that change. We uh, went back through, addressed a lot of the other kind of technical comments and concerns that the um, engineering department had, um, uh, uh, mostly concerning uh, the detention area and just, you know, kind of confirming some sizes to make sure everything was okay. Uh, we have since gone through done that, made the changes based on the road width and that uh, additional impervious surface um, and found no um, issue with the size of the detention basin. So the detention basin is remaining the same size. What we have done um, based on some of those comments and questions and concerns was we added a couple of screening trees. So those will be evergreen pine trees along the border between the detention basin itself and the trail. Um, we have also added a conservation easement uh, along lot one. Um, we did cut it off at the front yard setback and that's just because with the limited site distance um, in the area, there is gonna need to be some clearing um, for the site distances. And in the future, they may need to even cut that back even a little bit more as things start to overgrow and trees uh, start to uh, grow out um, a little bit more. That way there's no question or concern as to, hey, you can't cut these trees in this area, even if they're absolutely necessary to maintain those site distances. So once again, we did extend that across um, lot one so that the neighbor who had some concerns to the west um, about uh, us, you know, clearing limits of that nature, um, maintain even a little bit more uh, area. Uh, so 
and we are still, uh, we did adjust the, um, the overall size and shape of the conservation easement, uh, but it's still, we still maintain it's about uh, 16% um, or 15 and a half percent or so um, of the site. Um, so that number itself hasn't, hasn't really changed. Um, it is still um, the developer's intent to, even though, you know, we're, we're calling out only these specific areas as conservation areas, the developer himself is still not planning on clear cutting like up to that conservation easement area either. Um, so just so we might point out, we could see that we did save uh, a portion of trees between lots one and two. We've saved some areas um, of trees in the back of lot two and even a larger portion in the back, uh, in the back of lot three into the uh, southeast of lot three as well. Um, the site uh, drainage just still remains the same. So all of the site flows from the roofs will go underground. Uh, the site, uh, the road itself, the private road all will go into the detention basin. That detention basin is sized so that at the 100 year storm, um, after that, if there were a storm that large, it would overflow uh, to Copper Mine Road and into the Catch Basin and Copper Mine Road and not overflow into the trail. Um, I believe there were some other questions. And uh, Mark, if you could go to the um, that GIS image as well. Um, I think there was a question by one of the neighbors about fencing uh, across the street because he was afraid that the the road, yeah. yes, correct, so that the road, um, as people exited it, were going to be shining into the house. Um, so if you kind of uh, look at, just kind of take a mental note of, of this image here and where uh, the house is located, I believe that perhaps maybe this neighbor was more, was thinking that the existing driveway um, to the uh, west was maybe something that of concern, but that driveway will be eliminated um, and so where this road now comes out of the site uh, is actually facing more uh, the trail itself. Um, and so that shouldn't be uh, an issue as far as, as light pollution and like the front of the house. Um, I think that that answered uh, most of the questions. Um, I know that there was a question last week about potentially uh, adding a, a water fountain. Uh, we did speak with uh, town staff and engineering um, division on that. And, and I guess that that is something that has come up uh, at a, a couple of different locations, um, but there are a lot of concerns uh, on their end uh, about vandalism, about freezing in the winter and maintenance and uh, stuff like that. And um, as well as it being an offsite improvement. Um, and so that was not something that we uh, felt at this time would be something that we would add into uh, this site plan. So if there are any uh, further questions or concerns, I'll be happy to answer those if I can. Commissioners? This is Inez St. James. Um, so thank you again. Uh, and I'm glad that you um, clarified the topography because uh, I did go back, you know, for a walk and uh, it is mainly wooded. Um, I still think that to me, it feels like we're squeezing in houses wherever we can. I wish it was less houses, but I understand that you're meeting all the guidelines. Um, too bad about the water fountain. I was the one that brought it up. Um, <laughs> town of Canton currently has it and it's wonderful. Uh, so maybe we should be talking to other towns to see how they get uh, around some of the concerns um, and then um, I, I hope you don't have to blast. I understand there's a special permit for that. And because um, it is gonna, this subdivision is gonna impact the neighborhood. Uh, it is gonna change the character of the neighborhood. Um, and that's my opinion. Um, like I said last time, just because you can doesn't mean you should, but it is private property. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have questions or concerns? Uh, this is Matthew Pogson. Uh, first of all, thank you for, um, I wanted to thank our, our presenter today for making some changes to the uh, conservation easement area. Um, I think if I'm looking at this correctly, 
It's a little bit small on my screen here, but I believe I can see that it's delineated a lot further down into the first parcel. And um, I think that's really appropriate. And I think that it's, it's very uh, kind of the developer to do that. So I do appreciate you taking that into consideration. And I just wanted to make sure that was noted. Um, besides that, however, um, I just wanted to check with Mark and make sure that all of the engineering aspects have been um, met and that everything is the, the width of the road and everything else has been taken care of at this point. So Mark, Thank can you. you just give us that information? Thank you, Matt. I just had a discussion with Bruce here before he left for the evening. And I think Bruce is listening. I don't know if he can, uh, no, he may not be. At any rate, um, the, uh, they've, they've actually uh, met additional comments on the engineering review uh, dated April 8, 2020. Uh, but uh, in our discussion, in lieu of uh, creating another memo, uh, we would like to ask the commission if, if, the, if they're inclined to approve this evening um, that they um, cite this April 8, 2020 memo. Um, the, uh, the applicant does not object to any of these, um, uh, the remaining um, um, comments. Okay. What, um, what, I want to write that down. What was the, the, on that memo again? I'll make the April, motion on that. April 8, 2020. April 8. Okay. Um, and there were nothing, there was nothing that needed to be changed to that or anything at all, right? Nope, nope. Actually, they widened the road and they reconfigured the lots just slightly, but they've done that. Put the shrubs and, in. Yep. And they right. so and some of the comments that were so uh, Bruce was was satisfied that um, there's there's no changes that uh, would need to be made so significant that it would sort of throw the whole subdivision off at this point. Uh, okay. He's, he's satisfied with what they've done. There's still a couple of little minor items on the engineering uh, side that need to be tweaked. And their comments are fairly minimal, but we want to leave them in there as a matter of uh, condition anyway, just so that um, we can zip it up. Okay. And that included things like the HOA and the lights and all that stuff. That's all been alleviated, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, they're still, they're still on the end. Actually, they're part of the discussion, and okay. they need to be added to the plan. I, I don't know that we review them to that level, but... Um, uh, the, the applicant is and developer is aware of that, so they'll have to be addressed. Okay, and um, the exit to this uh, road is not going to be directly across from the existing house. That is correct, right? That's correct. Yeah. And, yeah, that's correct. And what I'd like to do is just show you this email that we got regarding that. The, the existing driveway is a horseshoe, and part of the horseshoe, I think, does dump out across from that house. Right across. So yeah. The other portion so is the part where they're using it. Correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, you're correct. The, the new road will come out further east. Yeah, considerably further east than even the other side of the horseshoe. Okay, and, very good. And, but bring up that thing also, because we got little little uh, criticism for not uh, getting to the letters. I, I'll just go through this one. Um, okay. This gentleman's uh, same concern, if you look at your screen, uh, after the lighting, uh, is the drainage pond. Will it can present any known issues with standing water, bugs, stagnant water smell? I believe this is a, um, a, deten a retention basin, more than a detention basin, mm -hmm. but I'll let Brian uh, speak to that. Uh, yes, that is correct, Mark. And, um... I'm not sure if everybody has the plans in front of them, but um, we, we can, you can kind of see it on our presentation drawing there. We have called out, um, yeah, so you can see there's a little pipe that runs through the center of the basin to the uh, outlet control structure. And that is gonna be an inf infiltration trench. Um, that will be below the surface of uh, anything. And what it will basically do is um, this will be all grass, um, and it, as that fills up, even in a, um, a very, very large storm event, a 100-year storm event, any water that's remaining in the actual pond itself, in the basin itself, um, as it's, that 
trench will just promote even more so infiltration into a stone trench under the grass into that perforated pipe and help to drain that and keep that base that basin itself as dry as possible. Um, we do have on our outlet control structure, um, we do have a, a low level uh, orifice. So even at the very ground level of that basin, we're you know getting water out. Um, but in the event that there's anything you know that where that what where the bottom of that basin because you know maybe it's just overly saturated it's just very wet uh, soil it's been raining for you know multiple days at a time uh, the intent of that uh, infiltration trench is to dry out that soil so that you don't end up in a condition where you have uh, you know a mosquito breeding ground or something of that nature um, so that has been we have thought about that and we have tried to uh, design this basin uh, in a way that will alleviate some of that concern. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> this is uh, Matt Pogson again. I, I know uh, you want to read this other one um, real quick, Mark, before I, I was going to finish what I was going to say, but if you want to read go this on, other. Go right ahead. Now this is, I just want to bring this up so that everyone can see it. This was one that you received the last public hearing. And, and I, I'm thinking that everybody got this. Um, from Richard and Hazel uh, Kozika. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Uh, this was this was uh, regarding 11 Copper Mine Road. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that the commission did receive this. It was discussed yes. at the last meeting. Yes, it was. I just wanted to make sure that that was stated for the record because this person felt as though um, they, they, that no one saw this. Uh, and I, if, I, if I don't miss my guess, again, for the record, um, one commissioner, I believe it was Inez, uh, actually commented on, the, on this letter. Um, and please do correct me if I'm wrong. No, we, I, I did receive this. I know I did. I don't know if everybody else did, but I, this is Matt Poggs, and, and I'm just letting you know that I did receive this affirmative one. Yep. Thank you. I think everybody did. Was there I don't know if there's anything more. Any other commissioners with questions? The, uh, this is Matt Hogson. The, the last thing I wanted to ask about and um, just clarify was that we are, uh, this drawing that we're looking at right now um, does not show a sidewalk. That is correct? That is correct. Okay. So there is no means of connecting this development to the walking path at this time, correct? No, they, if they want to get out, we looked at that. Um, if they want to get out, you're going to have to walk the road for this short, uh, whatever this is, 70 right. feet, 80 feet right here to get onto the trail. Okay. And that was obviously brought up at the last meeting and something that the developer was not looking to accomplish. Yeah, we, we brought it up again. <laughs> we, had a, we, had a, we, met, we met via Zoom uh, uh, from, from our living rooms. And uh, I, I, we, we discussed it at length. And the developer uh, uh, indicated that he would not, let, you know, does not want to. Uh, okay. Have the side. Well, other than that, I have no further questions. But I do want to just reiterate, I appreciate the consideration for the neighbor. Um, I did read that letter, and I was trying to take that into consideration when making my statements last time and this time. So, um, thank you for taking that into consideration, and uh, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners? All right, I'd like to say at this point that this is a public hearing, and I want to add something I maybe should have said at the beginning, and that is that I'm assuming that Patrick Pickarrier remains recused from this application, and John Vivert is the alternate sitting in. Am I correct? Should be. I want to make sure that goes into the record properly. Um, going on to um, anyone who is online who would like to speak either in favor of this application or in opposition to this application may do so at this time. Please come on to the line, introduce yourself by name and address. And we're going to go one at a time. Richard, you're on. Richard, are you there? Richard, are you there? 
It looks like he got muted. Okay. He looks unmuted now. Richard, it's your turn if you'd like to speak. Let's go to the other one. Is there another? There is. Hang on. Hello? Joanna? Yes. You're all set. Okay, so I'm speaking on behalf of my parents, which are Jersey and Helen Wisniewski. Um, so my parents have lived here for almost 30 years. And, you know, this copper mine has been a private road. You know, like in Hazel and Richard's um, letter, you drive off the road, it's one house per lot. Um, it's a really great community. You know, we all know each other. Um, now you're adding in four, four new houses that's gonna disturb the entire, you know, community here. You know, you're gonna disturb, I'm not sure how long you're gonna um, have this building going on. You know, it's gonna, all this construction and it's gonna disturb everyone. You know, I have small kids that go to my parents' house and you know, you have the trails, you know, everyone goes for a run just to have a peace of mind to clear their heads, you know, and now you have four houses building here you're going to have eight, eight cars coming in and out. And still, you're saying that, you know, the driveway's towards the east, but the light reflection is still going to go towards my parents' house. So my parents are asking for a privacy fence. You know, you are disturbing now, you know, their, you know, their, they have um, rooms in the beginning, in the front of the house. You know, everything has been private up, up till, um, up to now. And this is Joanna. Yes. That's Joanna. Do you have anything further to add, Joanna? Well, also for the, let's go back to the basin. Like, is that, like, how deep is that? Well, can it, like, in, you know, in my letter, you know, what, can a child fall in? Can there be danger to animals? You know, what is, you know, the basin looks pretty large to, for your, uh, for your uh, draft here. Yeah. So they're they're very basic. Uh, they're they're essentially all over the uh, all over the town of Farmington. Uh, I'm, I can let Brian uh, Panico, the design engineer, talk to the grade, but I can tell you that the basins are made to retain water when we have a storm and leach it off uh, slowly, um, so that it, it it goes back to a dry basin uh, relatively quickly. Um, but Brian, if you would, you might want to just talk about that a little bit. Uh, yes, and um, the other thing to consider with this basin is it, it does look very large, and in fact, it is very large. And from a square footage perspective, it is absolutely much, much larger per se than, you know, you might normally see. And the reason for that is, you know, typically when a, when a detention basin like this is designed, the easiest way to do it is you dig a hole a certain depth. Um, in this case, this basin is about, you know, three and a half, four feet deep. Um, but in the normal, normal circumstance, they would dig this with two to one side slopes, which means two feet uh, horizontally and one foot vertical. And that's a very steep uh, side slope. Um, and in this particular case, what we've done is we have three to one side slopes on the trail side. Um, but on the, ba on the other side where the road is um, and where it fronts the road, those are six to one slopes. And then as you work toward the houses themselves, they're actually, we get up to a nine to one slope. And okay, so will you put a gate around it or a fence? So, you know, a child doesn't fall in or any animals? So the, and the purpose of that, that increased slope is it's so gradual that if an animal were to walk into it, it they wouldn't be falling down. It's not gonna, it's not as much of a hill as you pr you're probably typically see. Um, in fact, the, the hill off the side of the trail down to the parking lot is, um, is greater than I believe two to one. So, um, you know, this is very, very gradual, and, you know, and, you know, we're talking about like a 5% slope, which is something that you'd see on like a sidewalk. Um, so for someone to kind of walk, an animal could very easily walk into this and walk right back out without an issue. Um, it's, it, you know, it would be very difficult for a person to accidentally uh, fall into this. 
Um, if you're on the street side, we have a riprap, um, which is that large stone um, out where the emergency spillway is in the event that it does, we, we do have like a hundred year storm, like I said, um, where it would leach back off into the road. So that large riprap itself uh, vi visually creates a barrier um, to people to say, hey, listen, this isn't somewhere I'm supposed to walk. This isn't all just grass. I shouldn't just walk right into here. Um, and then once again, um, the trail itself has a fence along the edge of the trail, which should and, and will, uh, and I would imagine will, deter people from walking off of the trail, off of the property owned by the town of Farmington and somehow into this basin. And then on top of that, we've also added the, the trees themselves, the screening trees at the top of that, um, the top of the basin as well to create, uh, once again, another form of a barrier. Um, okay, so let's just say that your drain gets clogged and no one notices it and it starts filling up with water. Now that's dangerous. Like you said, it's going to be three feet. So now someone can drown in there. Animals can drown. People can, you know, kids can drown in there. You know, who's going to keep an eye out on the drainage? Like say it gets clogged, you know, um, with, it doesn't drain properly. There are a couple of different safety measures that are on uh, these. There are trash racks over the outlets. So, um, and I don't know, Mark, if you can chime in, if you have any experience where you've seen a situation where one of these basins gets clogged uh, to a point where it's no longer draining at all. Um, well, I, I do. There, there's the Dunkin' Donuts on uh, Route 10 in Plainville where the, 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 the rack that you're speaking of uh, collects all of the, the mowed grass because I know these basins are so gradually sloped, they're typically mowed for maintenance two or three times a year. Um, the grass collects on top of the basin, but there's still a, an open slot in front that allows the flow to continue out. So while it may slow the flow down, uh, it will still eventually empty. And as you said, uh, uh, Brian, the, 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 the fail safe is the fact that there's the um, perforated pipe at the basin, at the bottom of the basin, that, that takes the saturated soil and drains it off and actually drains the, the, the basin itself without even having to have the water go through the, the weir and, and the, the orifices in the weir. So it, it, it'll, it, it typically will empty out of its own volition. Um, it, you know, it may take longer if it's clogged, but it will, it will do that. Right, and, and you're saying it should. That's not, you know, that's what I'm concerned about is the safety of so we, the neighborhood. Yep. So I think, you know, <laughs> There I needs to be more safety measures for this basin. I mean, I think that the other thing just to, just to consider from an overall perspective mm -hmm. um, is that, you know, and, and I know that there are concerns, but the other thing is, you know, there are plenty of properties, I'm sure, in the town of Farmington, you know, that have small depressions in them that in a hundred year storm event, in a hundred year storm event, that's a lot, a lot of water. It is, once again, it's the storm that happens you know, at a frequency of approximately every hundred years. And there are plenty of properties out there where there's enough of a depression that you could easily have a foot of standing water. And so, you know, I think it's important to, you know, to remember that, you know, if we're looking at absolute worst case scenarios where there's a possibility of drowning, you know, there's also plenty of rivers in the town of Farmington that if, you know, people aren't attended to or are not paying attention properly, you can easily get injured at any one of those as well. We've we've done our we we try to make these as safe as possible. If this were a situation where it was eight feet deep and there's a two to one side slope and it would be incredibly difficult to get out of if somebody were to happen to fall in, then there are def, there are regulations that require things like fences, and that is a common practice that we would explore. Um, but in a in this particular case, uh, I also personally, you know, I think that if we're worried about you know, kind of detracting from the neighborhood and the character of the neighborhood, you know, putting a chain link fence around a detention basin is probably the, you know, especially right next to the trail is, you know, is not a very attractive thing. And so that was kind of our intent in creating very gradual slopes and avoiding needing that fence is so that, you know, 90% of the time, you know, when it's not raining and there's no water in there at all, it just looks like yard. Um, and it just looks like, you know, more grassed area. Um, and so, and so that's, that was our intent. Okay, thank you. 
So in the end, we're just asking, you know, we're requesting, you know, for a privacy fence for a copper mine road. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So the town of Farmington cannot request offsite improvements of the developer. Um, you certainly can, and I'd be willing to share this information with you, um, and you can contact the developer directly. Um, we can't make any guarantees. We certainly can't require it, um, but you, you, can, you can ask. And that's why I switched privately. up. Yeah, privately. And I have your email from the um, uh, the email that you sent, and that's why I just checked this. Okay. And so I'll get you that information. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone else from the public? Richard, are you there? Turn them on. Richard, are you there? He's not muted. Let me turn him to panelists and see if that works. There he is. Richard, can you hear me? No, so he can't. Yeah, he's he's trying, but I don't know. What's going on? You, yeah. Okay. I don't know what to tell you. Mark, this is Matt Pogson. I'm just curious, does not having the ability for him to speak give us any sort of issue? Legally, you know, I really don't know, Matt. Given given the fact that we're meeting in this electronic is this the format, same Richard that wrote this yes. letter. I have no way of knowing. Uh, yes, it is actually. I do know. Yeah. It's the okay. Same who's, who's that speaking? That's it's Sandy. Sandy. So it's the same the same Richard Sandy. Yes, it is from Eleven Copper Mine that submitted the letter. Okay. So he must be listening because he was trying to speak. Yeah, I moved him in. At Mm -hmm. I moved him in as a panelist. He's unmuted. Um, I, but he I don't, still can't speak. He still can't I, speak. I know his, com his computer doesn't have a microphone, so he may need to call and dial in. Um, it looks like he, so there's a, he may so, have logged in on his computer rather than a phone. Correct. So, Richard, if we're, we're going to try to hang on for just a couple of minutes um, for you. If you go to the agenda, you'll see there's a phone number that you can call. And there's a webinar ID that you'll put in. And hopefully you'll be able to uh, access the, uh, the vocal that way. So it's 1-312-626-6500. Uh, and then there'll be a webinar ID right after that. That's on the agenda. mute some other people. Is there anyone else while we wait for Richard? My hand. So, so this is John Bibbert? Yes. Hello? John. Hello? When I Hello? when I look on the Hello? When I look on the attendings, I don't see Richard listed any longer. Yeah, he's under a panelist now, the Sandy. I think he's, I trying, moved him to up to pan. he's trying to say hello. You don't have a mic. You, no. More? Help. Is, Rich, is Richard there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes we can. Thank you, Richard. You can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have the floor. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, this is new to me, and we had a hard time getting through. Uh, we've been on the phone for the last 15 minutes trying to get in, but we're finally there. I'm going to read a couple things. One on the zoning. The subdivision plan from Carrier does not meet the intent or the past practice of the town on Coppermine Road. When we built, and that was 44 years ago, 
the intent of the town was to recognize a 125 foot frontage as the property as long as there was 30,000 square feet behind that. Our property is just over an acre and a half, yet the house could not be built till the property widened at the 200 foot west side property line. For past practice, just take a ride up Coppermine Road. And I'm asking that everybody on that committee come to this area and take a look at what is being proposed. Take a ride up Coppermine and you will see that all the homes are spaced according to the zoning frontage at different angles with some frontages being much wider. Our frontage has 24,000 600 square feet of fully wooded space just for our driveway because we could not put the house any closer. The property boarding to the south of the site was the other half of the subdivision you are trying to subdivide again and has one house on it, on it next to two others to the west at 2.43 acres and 2.78 acres respectively. So there's three lots right around this uh, site that are over two acres and ours is just over an acre and a half. Now let's look at the environment. During the past year, the danger of global warming resulted in protests and marches throughout the world, yet the proposal looks like business as usual. The 20 foot wide road going to four homes with driveways is a lot of pavement in such a small area. Add to that the almost complete removal of trees within the complex of houses. When you have to count out 11 trees, you are doing something wrong. Just look at our property. It's nothing but trees other than where the house is. On the east side of the complex, you have the water containment area. Now this is an area everybody has already mentioned, mosquitoes and any kind of other items like animals getting in, children and all that. Who will take care of this area when it's needed? This is a wet property and you probably don't know that due to the ledge and higher properties to the west being ours and the people above us. Along with a total area of pavement, driveways, and roof drains, your containment is going to fill dramatically. When it goes to the overflow position, it will take a long time. You seem to feel that it will uh, empty quickly. I do not think so due to the fact that the property is so wet due to the ledge. Now cost effectiveness, building houses is not a good way to raise the grand list. Seldom does a residence of this price range provide more taxes than they use, raising taxes for all of us. This property was set up for two homes. By doubling it, you're doubling the impact on the taxpayer. This is why we have zoning, where they are supposed to balance what comes in with what goes out. A personal note, this proposal shows me that there's a little lack of respect for the whole area. When you take that ride up Coppermine Road, you will see all these homes looking very nice like they should look in Farmington. Not a complex that is gonna be basically drawn down to almost no trees in the whole center where each house can see one another and have very little other than the 11 trees that are being required. Privacy between the houses and the public trail noise are also issues. In closing, the property was bought as is, as is, knowing that it had only one house on it, just as the adjoining larger than zoning properties have. The price was reduced, so you owe Carrier no special consideration. 
if they decide to exercise the lot nine option for a second house, that would be understandable, and that would be the intent of zoning as it was. It should be noted that not all residents have the ability to attend this type of meeting for various reasons. Waiting may not be such a bad idea after all. I remember one of the last things that was said at the last meeting was the carrier representative saying, we can't wait another month. Well, I think we need to wait a lot longer so that everybody can speak, everybody can get to a meeting, and this can be done right. And I do urge every one of you to come up this way, take a ride on Coppermine, look at the site, and if you want to pull in on number 11, we're here to greet you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak either in favor or in opposition to this application? Hearing none, I'll go back to the commissioners. Do the commissioners have anything they would like to add or ask? This is Inez St. James. Are we, please re, uh, clarify. So I know the road got, um, is wider now. Are we voting yeah. on this project with sidewalks or without, or is that up to debate? It's, it it's without, depends on what the motion is. Yeah. You cannot, we don't have a motion yet. Yeah. So the sidewalk requirement is not there for this size of subdivision on a four, you know, four lot subdivision. Four lot subdivision on a private road does not require sidewalks. The applicant has opted not to put them in. Um, so it's not something that you can require. So if you, if you move to approve it with sidewalks, you're asking, you're asking for something that your regulations don't allow you to. And essentially it's an appealable decision. Um, Got it. And just being new, well, I know it's April, but newer commissioner, do we ever do sidewalks? Just kind of listening to the gentleman uh, before me. Do we well, ever on standard, do? Yeah, on a, on a standard road, you, you definitely do. And on private roads, I believe of more than five, I, I believe it's more than five, um, you, you can require sidewalks. No, no, um, sidewalk. Do we as a commission ever visit? Sidewalk, sorry. Um, not since I've been here, Inez. All right. But I, I you know, it's it's not it's not something that. Um, uh, not as a group. It's not considered a meeting, then. Yeah, we can do it, um, but it has to be it has to be done as a meeting. Hmm. And just just hearing the residents, yeah. you know, it's uh, interesting. Uh, it would be nice if we saw how when this was flagged, you know, where things are going, and I'll just, and I again, I'll just say this. I think being so close to the bike path, I think actually having a sidewalk would be, to me, a security issue more than anything. I don't think you want to have a sidewalk here, nor does Copper Mine on Uberton Avenue have a sidewalk. So that's my comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Matt, I would go back to, oh, no, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, this is Matthew Pogson. I'm just, um, <clears throat> I want to say that I agree with the neighbors and their concerns. I really have a hard time with this parcel being divided up the way that it is. I've driven up that road many times. Um, I did just drive by there the other day and um, saw Richard down his driveway and I wanted to say something, but you know, we can't say anything in these circumstances. And I feel a lot for the neighborhood. It's a major change. The problem is that our regulations allow it. And if we were to try to limit the amount of places, uh, amount of houses, if we were to try to try to even add the sidewalk, we could find ourselves in a litigation that wouldn't really benefit the neighbors. It wouldn't benefit anyone. Um, and it's very disappointing. I would love to see us look at subdivision regulations in the future. I'd love to see us look at some of these regulations in general to make them more 
friendly to the neighborhoods around them, the existing neighborhoods. With this a recent um, application on Main Street, it's disconcerting to approve something like this when you know you kind of have to in some ways because you already have the regulation in place. And on the flip side of that, you know it doesn't fit quite right. So I, I just wanted to say that, and I, I do have a lot of you should be having this conversation after a motion has been put in place. I suppose is, it's, it's yeah. more of a, a situation where I felt as if it would be brought up now just because it might bring up different conversation from public or from even the presenter. But you're right. I, I apologize. I will, um, I'll end now and we can have this discussion uh, or any other discussion afterwards. I apologize, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, any other commissioners that want to ask a question? Hearing none, I'll go back to Brian. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we close this public hearing? Um, the only thing I would like to add, and you know, and we, we, we do hear the, you know, I do hear the neighbors and I, you know, we did try to make some, some changes to, to try to, you know, make, uh, to, try to appease some of these concerns um, and the only other uh, comment I would make is you know while this may not necessarily be um, and I know there's concern about you know the how the property is being used and the number of lots and how it's not representative of the character of copper mine the only comment I would I would make in, in regard to that is if we look at uh, paper chase drive Kent Lane and Walnut Farms just up the road here um, those are little offshoots off of copper mine that become much, much more dense. And as and actually, really, as you move down copper mine toward those streets as well, things do uh, get much more dense. So I think that you know, overall, you know, yes, th this is you know, this density is 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 different than perhaps the 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 houses directly across the street in these two neighbors. Um, in other areas of copper mine where you have roads, while they may not be private roads, uh, but Paper Chase and Walnut Farms that are roads off of copper mine, this density appears to be much more common. So th that would be our, our, only con our only other comment. Okay. And, and we thank you for all, of, for all your time for all the commission members. Thank you. You're quite welcome. With that, I will close this public hearing. Thank you. Hmm? They're going to put trees there? Yeah. Oh. So, we don't have anything to vote on as far as Farmington and High School is concerned, but we do have uh, Carrier Holdings, LLC. Um, in order to do that, we need a motion and a second to begin. Everybody hooked up? I believe so. They're thinking. They're thinking. They've got themselves muted. Have they muted themselves? Yeah. I mean, I can I can click on mute, but if they've got themselves muted, so. Need a motion for discussion at least. Well, you know. It, you can't just. Okay. Mark, can you hear me? It's Marcy. I'd... Yes, Marcy. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to approve the pro proposal for Copper Mine Road. May I have a second, please? Microbull, a second. A second. Thank you. Let's have a discussion. Who wants to talk first? This is United St. James. Um, sorry, thank you. It's, um, yeah. So um, I know that uh, the carrier company will do a good job. They're known for uh, good houses, efficient houses. 
Um, I'm still concerned that we have, we're squeezing way too many houses into this lot. Uh, they are following town guidelines, setback requirements, um, safety. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how we can say no to, to this uh, development. I, I propose no sidewalk, especially since there's nothing on Copper Mine or Newburton Avenue. And um, I think everything that we could have thought of has been done. Um, and that's my opinion, but I, I, I still think it's four houses is too much for that space, but um, they're within their guidelines. Anyone else? Uh, this is John Vibbert. Yes, John. Uh, so the thing that concerns me here is that it seems that when these uh, houses were originally put into this area, the occupants were presented with a, with a uh, approval from the town for oversized lots with the notion that there would be a single house on an oversized lot. And here we have the first of those lots being converted from a one house lot to a four house lot. And I'm concerned about the domino effect through this whole neighborhood of lower uh, Copper Mine Road so that uh, if this house can be converted into a uh, four house lot, so can the next one. So can't the one across the street. So can the next one up the street. And, I, and I'm concerned with the domino effect of lo allowing um, this sort of sub-development happening uh, when the original houses were built under a different premise. Yeah, that, that, that is pretty widespread across the municipality. And, and the, reason I'm, the reason I'm chiming in here, John, is to, to, um, and to answer your question and maybe talk to Matt's earlier question is, in order for the town, well, you know as well as anybody, if it complies with the regulations, it should be approved. But in order for the town to realign what, what's happening today with what was happening back in the, in the 40s and 50s and even 60s, it, it might mean going back to your zoning map and changing, uh, which is a pretty wholesale approach, uh, changing huge swaths of land in town uh, to be zoned as one acre, one and a half acre, two acre lots. And in doing so, everything that's been developed in the meantime then becomes existing non-conforming. Um, so, in, you know, what, what the carriers are proposing to do here is to build a development that complies in every respect with the town's regulations. Um, what you're talking about is maybe something worth talking about, but um, I don't know how we could apply it to this particular... System regulation. Yeah. Yeah. And this is Ines, uh, again, so there are no deed restrictions that speak to uh, what uh, the neighbor was talking about? No. No. Okay. Um, are you talking about the, the fencing or? Or the one house, like the positioning and the intention of the neighborhood? No. The houses have to be built, the ones, you know, with the exception of the one that's already there. Um, the way that they're articulated, it, pretty close to what they're going to need to be in order to maximize, um, you know, resale value and, and build a good, you know, decent sized house. Those look like 3,000 square foot homes, maybe, maybe plus. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and some of them, there's really not a lot of wiggle room, especially lot four. You've got big colonials right across the street. Right. Yeah. Other conversation? Yeah, this is Scott Halstead. I just, I, I guess I just want to add on to the conversation that um, we've been having. Scott, you're in all, well, you can speak. You can speak to it. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. Um, I, I agree with what Inez, with what John and Matt have said. It feels like, and I know it, it's not necessarily going to 
change the vote here, but it seems like we're having this conversation every week with a different development that we're trying to squeeze houses in. And, and if there's something that we can do to look at that longer term, I just want to throw that out there, I guess. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mike Rabolas. Yes, Mike. Um, you know, I think it's made, been made pretty clear that, you know, this development does adhere to all the regulations for the, for the lot. Um, and the few concerns that, you know, we had had last week were addressed by the developer. Um, other than that, I don't have anything. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Matt Pogson. I was just wondering, Mark, do we need anything added to the um, to the motion in order to ensure that the engineering report is adequately, um, you know, taken care of? Yeah, if you reference the, the engineering report, the date that I gave you, which I believe was the 8th um, of April. Subject to? Yeah, subject, you know, subject to the engineering report dated April 8th. You're going to be hitting. You're going to be hitting. Some of those have already been addressed, um, but the ones that do remain are, are are in that particular memo. You're, you're going to be you're going to be hitting everything that our engineering department is concerned about. So okay, yeah. then um, I'd like to make a motion for an amendment to the um, initial motion. Yeah. Is that the appropriate way to do that? Thank you. Um, I'd just like yeah. to make an amendment to include the engineering reports from um, April 8th and um, well, any other engineering reports that may accompany that uh, specific uh, report. Well, there's only one, isn't there? Yeah, there's one. So there's just one. one. Okay. All right. Very good. I need a second to the amendment, please. Well, uh, that's true, yeah. Marcy, I second. And the time Thank you. So there's a motion and a second to include the April 8th, 2020 memo from the engineering department as a condition of uh, this action. All in favor of that amendment? Aye. 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 Opposed to the amendment? Aye. <laughs> the amendment passes. Go back to the original motion and second, please. Is there any other conversation before we vote? Uh, Barbara, this is John. Yes, John. Uh, so I'm looking at the. Um, so I, I'm not looking at. Excuse me. I, I made a mistake. I like to talk. With, I would like to ask Sandy uh, if. At the last meeting, I was the one who was uh, proposed to be uh, the voting alternate. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. This is Sandy. Okay, fine. That's all. Okay. I announced that a little while ago. I, know. I, I know you announced it tonight, but I didn't recall from last time. Yeah. That's all. That's fine. Okay, does everyone know what we're going to what we're voting on? Yes. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I abstain. That's Matt Are Pogson. You gonna ask, you're abstaining? Yes. For what reason? Um, due to the fact that I made comments during the public meeting, and I do believe that that may change my uh, bias on the situation. So I abstain. So is that removing your comments? Is that what you want to do by abstaining? I, I'm not sure that that's how that works, but if that is, no. I'm, I'm, that's fine. But I, I think abstaining it is the best position for making the statements during an inappropriate time. So I abstain okay. from Okay, that's fine. Okay. It's a positive vote. So we get five yes. Did you vote? I will vote on okay. this in, in the finality of it. Um, I probably should do a roll call on votes. Maybe. Because we're not sitting among each other watching. 
Um, Mike? I'm uh, yes. Matt is an abstain. Inez? Yes. Marcy? Yes. John Bibbert? Yes. Okay, so it's 5 1. Okay. So that carries 5 to 1 with uh, Matt abstaining. Thank you. Um, planner's report, do you have anything to report? I have, I have nothing for you this evening, but I'm willing to listen if anyone has anything for me. Mark, Mike Bullis, quick question. Hi, Mike. What's up? Hey. Um, I was just on, um, was on one of the real estate websites yesterday, and uh, for, I believe it was... Say that again, Mike. It's a little... Main Can you 244 hear me? Main a little, yeah. little fuzzy. Say 244 Main Street. Yeah. Is there something coming before us? It was it was um, advertised as uh, an expansion of the of that 240 244 Main Street. Just Unionville or Main Street Farmington? Farmington. The, where the oh, old you're old talking. Riley's you're talking about the old Irish. Uh, yeah. The old Irish. Yeah. We we may be getting something, but I haven't seen anything yet. We've gotcha. been talking with those folks for quite some time and um, just heard from a, an associate today about uh, the possibility of them moving forward with a site plan, uh, some, some improvements to the structures and um, improvements to the parking area, some landscaping. So it, Nothing yet though. No, no, nothing yet. No, they're obviously uh, yeah, he, he does He does get a little ahead of himself. This is uh, Thomas, the guy who did the properties next door. Yes, uh, I, and it was advertised as a expansion redevelopment, and I was just, it was like a site plan that was actually online, so I was just curious about it. Oh, there's a site plan online. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, that's great. <laughs> we, uh, haven't, and we haven't seen it. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're quite the guy. <laughs> Thanks. Does anybody else have anything for, for Mark? No. Nope. I actually have a Hearing? quick question. Uh, Matt Pogson here. Um, I w it's actually similar to Mike's. I was looking at the GIS report when I was looking at this carrier development, and I went to go look over at my property. Um, next door, there's an area under review. Um, so the GIS specifically says area under review. Um, does that mean that you guys are looking at it right now, or what does that mean in general? Well, it could mean a couple of things. It may mean that um, the the size of the property doesn't jive, uh, or the you know the GIS measurements are out of whack with the actual um, the In, survey. Yeah. Uh, there, there's there's a lot of things that could be you know that could could you know, be resulting in that that um, notation. It may just be that there's a a mismatch. Um, it's, there's a there's a number off from the uh, on the assessor's identification. Um, but what what happens is those reports are generated and looked at and and um, uh, cured relatively quickly here in Farmington, one of the better towns that I've seen in terms of their GIS maintenance. But um, uh, our GIS guy is now uh, working as best he can from home. Um, okay. Compromised and it's, it, it'll happen, but it'll be, a matter of, it'll be a matter of time. Okay. The only other question refers to the um, clearing on the mountain. Our mountain has basically been cleared off for the most part in front of houses. Um, is that something that's going that uh, are we addressing it or are we just kind of I mean I I, battle I wish I could battle? I wish I could tell you that I have that kind of eagle eye Matt I, I don't but if you have something specific for me you, you need to let me know and we will investigate okay um, have you know, we gone any further with the uh, original uh, infraction which one is that I'm gonna say yes the, the ones that I know about yes um, up on Pinnacle, I believe, right? That's um, yeah, um, 21, I think. Right. We were supposed to have plantings in by now, I believe. Yeah, they did plant their trees, and okay. uh, we had we had some arguments up there on the ridge line. 
the, the trees were the size they were supposed to be, but they sort of, they had to almost blast to get them where they were. Um, but they, they do look sturdy. They are taking. Uh, we're going to go back this spring, or we could probably quickly anyway, uh, to reinspect and make sure that they're, they're doing their thing. Um, but yeah, they, they, did, they did get planted. I can't remember the guy's name, uh, but 21 Pinnacle or 21 Pinnacle Ridge, I believe is what it was. Stefanowski, is that it, or Steph, something like that? Yes, yeah, that's very course. familiar. Yeah, very familiar. That's okay. Well, thank you for following up on that. I I may actually send oh, what, you a couple. I'll things. tell you, I, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe what a what a pain that is, and, and the um, yeah. Well, they they didn't make it easy either. So, but eventually we got it done. Um, now it's just a matter of waiting until the trees grow back, um, that's, which is unfortunate. And um, we're Mark, also looking into Mark, I just wanted to, yeah, that, they, that, uh, that house is under deposit. I was going to add it too. Oh yeah, I don't know if, if uh, Bruce uh, uh, got up there to inspect, but that's one thing I left with them. Um, so we're going to, I'll have to actually make a note of that. And that one is 31 Pinnacle Ridge, the Sisti house. 31 Pinnacle Ridge. I know that we made contact and uh, we spoke with uh, his attorney, um, uh, Bob Reeves. Uh, so I'm just not sure of the outcome, but I can get that to you. Thank you. You got it. Anything else? I have a motion to accept the minutes from the April 13th meeting, please. It's I move to accept the minutes, Matt Hogson. Second, Inez St. James. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Anything else? So just to you clear are adjourned.